you guys. My name is Laurie March. I am a project manager and a producer. And today I am merely here to teach you the amazing people who are coming right after me on the stage. Um, this is a cool little thing. I think you're going to love this. Um, I want to introduce you to somebody who is just fabulous, who I've known for a long time. Um, Sherry Qualls is the CEO of White Good Marcom Agency. Um, she's a lead consultant on the NKBA Global Connect program. This is really cool. This is an omnidirectional initiative with the NKBA with lots of international associations and organizations, manufacturers, really just kind of connecting kitchen and bath folks and this marketplace all across the globe. Now, Sherry and Veronica Miller, I feel like everybody has heard both of these two names. Uh, they have curated a wonderful panel of experts who are going to pop out here shortly all about international design and business trends that we're introducing here at KBiz this year. Is Sherry out here? There we are. Come on up. Let's get a big round of applause for Sherry Qualls. <laughs> Woo! -hoo! All right, Sherry, take it away. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks so much, friends. Our last day. Whew. Feet tired. But this is going to be a fun little panel because we're going to talk about global design trends. And one of the things that um, we are really excited about is that for the last uh, five years, coming on sixth year, we have developed at the NKBA a fabulous program called Global Connect. Global Connect has given us an opportunity to really begin bringing international brands over to the States and Canada um, in a safe way to help them do a fabulous job rather than kind of soloing their opportunity in the marketplace. In doing this, we've had the opportunity to also bring international buyers um, to this marketplace who are very, very interested in sussing out the various things that are going on in North America, as well as possibly getting involved in business relationships with North American suppliers. So part of the reason I bring that up is because our panel is comprised partially of some Global Connect people. Um, we have uh, folks that we'll be introducing in a minute. But before that, I wanted to bring kind of, um, or, or talk a little bit about our keynote for this panel. And I wanted to make sure that you knew that this woman, um, I think is, is probably has not been home for a consecutive week in about four months. Her name is Patty Carpenter. And Patty is a uh, global trend ambassador. She is um, also a, an amazing, talented um, representative of a variety of interesting um, brands. She has worked with Ralph Lauren. She's worked with Crate & Barrel. She travels all over the world, identifying trends, identifying directions, macro and micro. She is very interested in the artisan world and works philanthropically in preserving a quite deal, a quite a bit of um, artisan uh, craft and technique. And so Patty is going to speak with us today about what she's been seeing in the last few months of her travels. Um, I think you will see that some of this has actually found its way onto the show floor, which is really quite cool. Um, she recently returned from Maison Objet in Paris, so she's got some fresh ideas to bring forward there. And so what I would like to do is take this minute to say, Patty Carpenter, please come forward and share your amazing insights with us. Hello everyone, how are you? It's the last day, and in my first cabus, and I've been clocking about 17,000 steps a day. 
<laughs> so I don't know about you, but I'm a little weary, but I'm very excited to be here. It, being the first one, it just feels like I'm trying to take in so much. But as Sherry said, I'm on the road a great deal. And so today what you're going to see is really an overview of how we talk about top-down trends, really looking up at about 30,000 feet to what people on the cutting edge are doing. And then I talk a bit, as some of you have seen in our designer breakfast, about how some of those things trickle back. But I'm often asked, um, let's see if I can cue this. Yes. I am often asked um, sort of, you know, how does one track trends? How do you do that? How do you know what to look at and what not to look at? How do you, how do you discern what that is? And so what uh, we coined several um, years ago with our clients is something that we call spent. And that really talks about the big buckets that we look at as trend forecasters and researchers. Um, so we look at the S, which is for social. And of course, that's a big S, but underneath that would be something like art or music culture, whatever's happening in the pop culture. Those are the kinds of things that we're looking right now. We're talking about those really big macro trends. The, the P is for political, what's happening in the world politically, because none of us are immune to that in terms of what, what is triggering us as consumers down the road. E is for economics. Certainly that's become very top of mind for everyone here as we constantly hear about inflations and recessions and what's going on. And so that's a really big, you know, um, and, and all of these are very important, but you can certainly see how at certain times, some of them would rise to importance more than others. Then we go to end for nature. That certainly, as you move through the show, the constant conversation about biophilic <laughs> and the idea of our connection to nature, how we as humans respond to nature is really top of mind. Even in the color green, I just posted um, about all the greens that I'm seeing here. And we've been talking about green for years now, but the idea that they've made their way into kitchen and bath is really quite interesting because we've been staying at home. We've been and dealing with nurturing ourselves and our families, and as we talked about yesterday, our multi-generational families, and so nature certainly does play a huge part. And then the last T is the T, and that's for technology. And of course, again, as we talk about how everything's becoming smart, I just left a talk talking about the metaverse and NFTs. We're going to touch a bit on that here as well, but there are all kinds of big macro uh, impacts that are coming through. So the first is for social. Oh, this re reconfigured it a little. So socia. Oh. <laughs> or social. <laughs> um, and so I've broken them all down. This is going to be a really quick 10-minute talk so we can get to the panel. So I'm from New York. I'm going to talk fast. Um, but talk to you. Come see me after if, I, if it's not clear. So in the, in, in the beginning of this, in terms of social, we're going to focus on the art part of social for this particular one. We're looking a lot at Brutalist and Bauhaus in terms of the shapes that we're seeing, the art schools and movements that have been very important. But it really has driven through into things like cut cut work for Matisse, which is sort of what you see in the back on that on the wall, big murals as wallpaper. You've seen some of that in terms of how people are even decorating their booths. But we're also talking, I mean, in, in New York, uh, sorry, and in Paris, I don't know what city I'm in now, in Paris, the Matisse family has set up a new Matisse um, boutique on the left bank where they're taking his, they're being inspired by his artwork and doing home decor, which is really fun and beautiful and very colorful. I urge you if you're in Paris to see it. Um, so that's sort of the kinds of things that we're looking at as to what, what's happening in the zeitgeist that's making those kinds of things come forward. And if we talk about, just quickly, Brutalist and, and Bauhaus, this idea of form and how, look, notice when you move through how many beautiful, simple shapes, geometric shapes and forms you're seeing. That's really coming off of that influence. And volume, how things have gotten rounder, this whole curvilinear form. Um, and so as we talk about um, meeting in the metaverse <laughs> under this umbrella of art, what we're talking about is some interesting things. I'm not going to talk about every picture because we won't have time, but the, in the center there, you're looking at the new BMW that just came out. It has the ability to change 240 cells on the car to create a customized color car. This just came out. <laughs> they had one before that only could switch from black to white. Now they've added this one where you can have 32, 32 uh, sorry, 240 panels and 32 different color combinations within it so that you can make a customized car. This is the kind of thing that we're talking about. It's in real life, but it's evocative of a video game. It's evocative of being in the metaverse. On the side there, you'll see me and the LV store, which was a pop-up in downtown Manhattan just before I left for Paris, and then the Tokyo store. They have done a huge collaboration with Yayoi Kusama, who is a very famous Japanese uh, painter. She's 93 
93 or 94 now, and she only does dots. She does them because she's checked herself into a sanitarium years and years and years ago in her 20s, and they keep her sane, she says, to do dots. And she's become very, very famous, and the way that they played it out in the stores is she does these things that are called infinity rooms, and you go, you look, you go into, I've seen several of her exhibitions around the world, but you go into the room, and you look into these boxes, and it just goes on and on and on and on and on with dots. So this is what they're trying to recreate in the space physically at, a, at the various Louis Vuittons around the world. And I urge you to look on Instagram. They're phenomenal, some of what they've done. They spend a tremendous amount of money. And then down on the bottom, just for a quick fun thing, is how we're looking at furniture, where we're taking these bright colors, bold colors, lots of volume. We're giving dimension because texture is really important. So those are the kinds of things that we're talking about when we say meeting in the metaverse. Then we go to the P for political. And we're really talking, this time we're going to drive into the political side as it deals with the global culture. So we're talking about this global rich interiors and how we're seeing things that have to do with travel, um, our yearning for travel to get back out there after we were forced to be shut down for so long is really making us look at product very differently and value product from different parts of the world. And so here you're looking at all kinds of things that caught my eye in terms, again, from that 30,000 feet up. One of the most interesting is that Burberry piece that you see on the side there, that Burberry check. That is milk-based paint that has been sprayed on a volcano in the Canary Islands because they are the first island to be run solely on wind power. And so they are wind sustainable. And so Burberry wanted to call that out. So you see a brand collaborating with something like wind power. This is really going to drive what's happen happening politically. On the top, you see something from, I think they're... T check with me later. I, I don't want to keep re referring to my phone, but it's a it's an organization that's giving um, designers and and interior uh, and architects alternatives to using plastic. They have a hundred different alternatives that they have amassed, so that you can go to their database and do something other than plastic, which is going to go out and hurt the world. But we're also talking about when we look about origins that inspire our originality. Um, some of the other things you're seeing is a combination of collaboration between indigenous artisans. As Sherry said, I have a real feeling and love for that that ad hoc did with Mexican artists. So they took, um, you know, high-end designers and paired them with paired them with artisans. So that little set of tables, as an example, that's all hand-cut leather on the front of that that they did with an artisan. That's um, all the, the beautiful light wood table at the bottom with the great turned pieces is also done as a collaboration with an artist, an indigenous artisan and an artist and, and a high-end designer. What you're seeing in the center is the new steel case collaboration where they've looked back to Frank Lloyd Wright as their inspiration. That's just coming out. And then on the bottom, on the uh, next to the Frank Lloyd Wright, those are bottles that Lalique just commissioned a designer to work with, and he was inspired by the, the monks, um, Buddhist monks, so where they stayed and where they prayed. So the boxes and the bottles are inspired by that. So we're looking back to our origins to come up with new things. Then we go to the E for economic. This is, um, I included this picture because this is the Obsidian House that the Black Artists and Designers Guild did about a year and a half ago. I don't know if any of you saw it, but it's completely done. It was done with 20 some designers and each one did a different space, but this is all done in the metaverse. This is a completely, um, it doesn't exist, but they had a, they, they found a space in California that they used as the, the lot for the house. And then the entire house was built to be um, a retreat and a respite f in the home. So everybody was really inspired by biophilia. You see furniture, you see um, beautiful color, you see certainly texture and all these kinds of things. But you can see this online, the Obsidian House. And so as we move into, it's all about the Benjamins when we talk about economics. We're really talking about those big drivers that are you know, really affecting how we're looking at the world and what we're going to be thinking about and doing. So certainly the war in the Ukraine has had a huge effect from everything from grain, you know, in terms of food sources in all parts of Europe to certainly the oil prices and what's going on with oil. We see, you know, China's having to deal with COVID for so long. We all know the effects of how everything shut down. We weren't getting our things on time. So we found alternate ways. People started to go local, which was a huge driver for this. That was one of the biggest drivers for that. We also talked a lot about the circular economy and why and how we want to be better stewards of the planet on w that, we, we, that we inhabit. And then certainly, lastly but not least, the whole idea of inflation and what that's going to mean for our industry. And does, is it a really huge driver or is it something that we've certainly gone through before and we'll learn how to go through again? 
And then the N for nature. Here we're rooted in our retreats. This is all about the idea again of biophilia, that sense of bringing the outdoors in, the sense of expanding our outdoor space to be more comfortable. We as humans need this nurturing from nature. And so that's a huge driving force. And so some of the things I put here for us to think about in terms of large scale ideas, um, on the top center, that's an Aesop um, store where they now use bulrush and hemp for their furniture. So they're really going back to the land. They're really working with um, our uh, product designers to come up with better usage of, of materials. We're talking about reconstituted and recycled hemp. Um, we're talking about on the bottom that silo um, um, uh, restaurant is in East London and it is really made, it's a, all about circularity. So that's um, lighting that is made out of mycelia, which is grown from mushrooms. So we're not taking anything away from the planet. We're really trying to, you know, to incorporate new ways to think about where our materials come from. They use a tremendous amount of cork, which doesn't harm the planet at all. You don't have to kill the tree or chop it down in order to get cork. They use a lot of recycled and reconstituted glass. So when they have wine bottles and things, uh, they break those down and they, re they, they reuse them for part of the architecture and structure of the restaurant. So just thinking about things differently. In the center on the bottom where the color is, those are two different designers out of um, design school in London. One is growing bacteria in color to create colored textiles, and the other is, is, is using bacteria to create new colors, and so she's dying with bacteria. But it's the idea that you don't have to use, um, you know, it's, it's an expansion of natural dye. So it's this idea that you don't have to use chemical dyes, harm the planet. The idea of dyeing textiles having come from the fashion industry was one of the most heavily polluted pollutant kinds of things you could do because we, especially denim, use a tremendous amount of water just to create. So designers of, uh, in the fashion world are really looking at ways to reduce that water. In the center, that gorgeous piece that's kind of undulating is a new um, above ground walkway in Tokyo where they decided not to, in a park, uh, right at the edge of an urban area, so they decided they didn't want to disturb the land, so they built this walkway to follow the earth that's there. And what happens when you're up above that is you have a better view even of your surroundings. So it's really looking to give you a more immersive experience in being in this park. And then down on the bottom, one of my other favorite things is this bioplastic that they've created to replace, uh, you know, cling wrap. <laughs> and so it's it's com totally com um, combust uh, compound, what is it, compostable, and it's made out of potatoes. So it's really quite interesting. And then the last is our T for technology, and then we'll get to the panel and all the wonderful people that are coming up to talk. And this is really our reset to reality. And so what we're talking about here is how we're going to work, how we're going to live. Um, you know, really rapidly over the last few years, the design has really become very agile and very adaptive in order to include technology, try to find that way of having a seamless experience um, as we talk about how we're going to live with technology. And so these are a few things that I wanted to call out here. That young lady is wearing something that's supposed to be rolled out in the next couple of months. It's from Dyson. It is something that is supposed to be noise and pollutant canceling for urban dwellers. So we're going to all be walking around in the cities wearing that soon from Dyson. And you know from Dyson it's going to be costly. <laughs> then next to it is um, a new way of, of working with warmth in our homes for blankets. And so this has a con that's a throw that has a conductor yarn that's going through it, but the yarn is solar powered. So the idea is that you charge your throw in the day and then you have something warm and cozy in the evening and you haven't used any electricity. Um, the two buildings, the one on the top, for me it's the top left and on the bottom right, are both made with hemp Concrete. This is something that's really been a focus, the idea that concrete is a, a certainly a huge building material and it gives off a lot of CO2. And so what a lot of people have been working on is how to reduce that. So the man holding the cube is holding a limestone and concrete composite that they've created, which gives off less um, um, CO2 emissions as well. But the hempcrete, the bottom one in pink is in the Netherlands, the top one in white is in France. They're new buildings, but it's this whole idea of using something other than concrete. The herringbone floor that you see there in that picture uh, on the left under the white building is all paper pulp instead of wood. So it's people starting to look at we don't have to chop down 
uh, trees to get beautiful planks for flooring, but it still uh, has that, that ability to feel like a wooden floor. And then I could not close out without a toilet. This is the new waterless toilet, waterless, from Samsung and, Mike, and Bill Gates. And it's, um, it's a prototype, but they're really talking about the idea that this is a way that you're going to end up having a waterless toilet. And you can talk to me a little bit more afterwards about how it's supposed to work. I don't want to get into all of that with everybody. But anyway, so, oh, sorry. So as always, I encourage everyone to live life colorfully. And if you need to get in touch with us, to work with us, we look at the from the 30,000 feet up all the way down to whatever you're making tomorrow. So please get in touch and thank you. And now the panel's going to come up and we're going to delve into this. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Fast. <laughs> Hello? No. Oh, they put the mics on. Can you turn the that mic on? That was fabulous. Thank you very, very much. So now what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite um, the rest of our panel to come up. So Kirk and Tony and Haley, come up, and I'll give a couple of words about um, each of you. And feel free to join in. I could listen to Patty all day, honestly. She has so much good stuff to share. But now we're going to bring it down a little bit, and we're going to talk specifically about what's going on in kitchens and baths, and I'll come over and join you in the chair so that we don't mess up the mics. Okay. So before we get started, I do want to introduce some um, more officially, and I'm going to use my notes. I apologize, because I don't want to misspeak about anything. So starting on my right, we have a design duo who happens to be married. There's definitely a story behind that. You have to ask them later. Um, both these kids run a, a design studio as well as a design consultancy. I believe you have two locations, design studios, in, under the name of Day True in the UK, specifically in London. Yep, okay. And the design consultancy is referred to as Skyrocket. Sounds very out there. I'll let them kind of describe a little bit more when they're talking about um, how they bring that into play. And then next to them is our friend Kirk Mengels from Germany. He is a member of the board of the German Association of Kitchen Furniture Distributors. Now, for those of you who have not um, spent any time with our European kitchen furniture friends, a little description. Um, in the international market, specifically in Europe and somewhat in the UK, um, kitchen cabinetry is typically built in a more modular component-based way and is referred to as kitchen furniture, which we love as a, as a category. So... What's interesting is because of the way that these products are manufactured, they're able to be distributed very differently than the way we operate. So there is a distribution association for which um, Kirk is involved. He also has had, though, quite a career in the kitchen industry, having worked for the Association of Modern Kitchens, as well as also having written on the editorial side about kitchens. So we love that kitchens are in your soul. And Tony, you began working on the manufacturer side of things with the likes of people like Jacuzzi and um, others, and then decided to come to the dark side, working on, uh, on the design dealer side. So now that we've got everyone's credentials straight, we all know Patty, we know everyone else, let's get started. So, Kirk, after hearing uh, Patty's presentation, what resonated for you when thinking about the European kitchen market? Hello, all together at first. So, uh, yeah. and Patty, thank you very much for this great presentation. Very inspiring, and uh, I love the point of view to go to the global mega trends and to look at it from this perspective. And I think when you're visiting the booths here at the show, you also can see that slightly we are going ahead to match this global trends even more. 
but still that there are global trends and uh, there are also big differences between the markets. And for me, I'm unbelievable happy to be here and to see at the last two days this big differences as well. So we have colors, as we mentioned before, the green color, you see it everywhere, of course. But nevertheless, even when you come to the uh, Germany pavilion or German pavilion right next to us, you see even the differences between the kitchen manufactured in, in Europe and the kitchen manufactured in here. And this is absolutely great to see it at one show. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Tony, what was your biggest takeaway from Patty's discussion? Um, I think for me, it's, um, it, it, you know, what we're doing in the UK is, 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 is really taking a lot of what those, you know, those trends were. I, you know, before we sat down, I wrote down health, well-being, sustainability, personal. Um, and then, you know, you mentioned it, the metaverse as well. You know, you have, to, you have to have a view on what's going on there. We, as a business in our retail business, we've just introduced uh, 4D so we're designing in 3D, but now you, we can put a headset on someone and show them the kitchen in 4D. I keep saying I want to be the first person in the UK to design a kitchen in an NFT kitchen. Yeah. So, so really, it's all the things, you know, I use different words, but absolutely, they're all the trends that we're seeing. I think the pandemic made people reassess how they want to live. Um, and health, well-being, sustainability, nurturing, having more personal things within their spaces are, are all key things that we're seeing and doing, definitely. Super. Haley, anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I agree. I think you agree? Yeah. I know it's not as often that happens. <laughs> um, but I do, and I do think, I mean, even okay. looking down here, you are seeing some of that in, in, you know, on the stands and things we're seeing, more organic shapes, curves, texture, colour. Um, so, yeah, you. I completely agree. Fabulous. So, Tony, you would mentioned the whole post-pandemic situation. I, I, honestly, I'm actually kind of tired of it. But um, it, there, it was obviously an important part of impacting the way we live. Um, and there are differences that have come about that are probably not going to change um, or, or revert uh, for a very long time. Um, when we think about, Kirk, how the pandemic impacted the environments that you're connected with from specifically Europe, how, how has it influenced space and product design from a European perspective? Yeah, the corona pandemic changed the market uh, big, with a big change. So uh, when you look into the product and you look at the people, even in the time the people cannot go out, but they still have a lot of money. And especially in Europe, the interest rate was very, very low. So the people want to spend their money and they want to invest it in their houses. You can see this. And so this has a big impact for bathrooms and especially for kitchens. And also the taste changed a little bit. Uh, it was before a little bit more neutral a little bit more sterile but now they want to have it more cozy they want to have it more comfortable they they want that their living room and the kitchens are matching together even more so in Europe the open kitchen is the big topic uh, now for a decade and it's still a big topic so I think nearly every new built house is with an open kitchen but now the people are more interested to, sh to look that really the living room and the kitchen are fitting together. And so this entire space is growing, in the, even in the corona pandemic, even more. So the kitchens now are bigger than before, and they are looking more comfortable, more cozy, and with much more warm color than before. Super. Yeah, absolutely. Tony, uh, in the UK, around bathrooms, we, we talked a little bit about bathrooms when we were talking together uh, earlier. How are you seeing, again, post-pandemic? I think, uh, again, it's, it's the uh, introduction of um, well-being um, in the bathroom, people using the spaces more as, as, as a zone to... Well, there's, there's two things. There's making the everyday space somewhere where you can use it quickly get in get out get clean get out to work and then and then you trying to find another space or using technology within those spaces then that where they can 
get a bit more relaxation um, and a bit more well-being. So it's either finding a misused space. We always say, you know, a main bathroom is very rarely used now in a house because you use your master en suite. So could you turn that main bathroom into more of a well-being space, into more of a spa? So at the end of a hard day, you can go in there and sit, relax, um, which all helps with mental well-being and everything else. And if you've not got a space to do that, there are products out there that, you know, there's, a, there's an extension that you can put on the end of a shower hose now uh, where you can use Knight water therapy. So even just using water and, 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 and you know, a 100-pound um, piece can help change and, and do that as well. So it doesn't mean you have to spend a fortune to get some of that well-being and everything else as well. So Hayley? Yeah, I, yeah, again, I agree. <laughs> but, um, it's not often. Um, but certainly self-care and, you know, use it, doing more with the spaces you have um, in bathrooms and kitchens, you know, the merging of spaces. So, by, you know, it, they are getting bigger because they're multifunctional uh, and merging spaces. Um, but bathrooms certainly, I mean, in our showroom in uh, Wimbledon in London, that we have a fully working spa in the basement to demonstrate you know, the effect that wellness can have. And customers can come in and try it. Like the kitchens, you know, a lot of people have working kitchens in showrooms so they can demonstrate cooking. We're doing the same with the bathrooms because until people really experience it, they don't understand the benefits. And so it's allowing them to make informed decisions that improve their life. Yeah, and we purposely made the space downstairs into, into normal bathroom size spaces to show it off, rather than it just being one vast space showing, you know, with a sauna and a, and a, a, you know, and a jacuzzi in it. These are realistic spaces that people could do in their own home sort of thing. And you know, in British homes are a lot, lot smaller than uh, US London. homes, especially yeah. in London, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, very smart, very smart. So Patty, with all the amazing traveling you do, I've no doubt that you've experienced a number of shifts in design both space and products post-pandemic. If you were to think about the top three, because you've been traveling all over the world and once you could travel again, you started. What are the ones that just kind of shocked you? And then in other ways, it was a complete shutdown of things that didn't serve us well anymore. So in terms of the kinds of things that we definitely see, those open spaces, larger spaces, because they are accommodating multi-purpose. One of the other things I wanted to call out when you were talking about the spa was, um, I don't know how many of you have gone over to Kohler, but they have the fragrance attached and the whole Gorgeous. idea of incorporating fragrance now in a lot of the different spaces in the home is really important that's much different than just lighting the candle it's a lot more um integrated if you will um and then certainly light and sound have become also very important and i'm i'm very intrigued by how many different types of places people have inserted lights in the bathroom and lights in the kitchen i the signature kitchen with the disco refrigerator is you know very funny where they've got the disco but but it's that idea of what what it what it really speaks to is engagement yeah. that we really want to be engaged and interactive and and in, and intentional and focused when we're in when when we're in our homes we want to sort of leave that outside world you know, out there and really come inside and be inside. Yeah, you, you mentioned a couple of things that I think are have been struggles for a long time in terms of really trying to get that more ambient environment, whether it's the lighting or the scents, you know, they're, they're all so important. But I think the technology has now come so far that it's allowing us to really do it better and more gracefully. Yes. Super. So, Haley, you and Tony both use the term personalization. Um, it's a term that certainly has been around forever. Um, how are you defining that differently than maybe five years ago? Yeah, it's, it's definitely people want something that's more individual, a space to display things. You know, so the kitchen does become more of a home, yeah. less of a functional space. It merges. Um, so, and, and as Patty was saying as well, noise and senses are really critical, especially if you've 
you know, got a massive extractor that's really loud, that's that's harmful, really. So we, so I mean, we, we see a lot of, um, you know, induction technology with downdraft extraction because it's very quiet. It only functions as much as it needs to. And um, there's a lot of gas going on here. We notice. <laughs> no, this is a this is a very timely conversation, obviously, <laughs> given the most recent. Um, reports out of our federal government, right? There have been all sorts of concerns. 40% of our population uses gas. So it's a, it's a little bit of a challenge when you have, you know, the federal ministries kind of talking about, yeah, we're going to kill the gas thing. Um, so it's an ex excellent, excellent point. I, we're amazed, to be honest with you, that um, the lack of downdraft and induction that we've seen here because it would be something that we would be doing in our everyday planning for a 90, kitchen. 90% we are selling. I, I, I thank you for this. Um, we, uh, we as a country have had, much like the European kitchen furniture problem, the experience that we have historically had with electric has not been positive. And so what we need to do is re-educate ourselves. We do have a challenge, though. I mean, regionally, I was actually speaking with a builder about this uh, the other day at Starbucks. Um, and he was talking about the fact that in Taos, New Mexico, if you want to put a fully electric home in that theoretically will be more efficient long term, that the grid can't handle it in the, the area where he is. So you as the homeowner are taxed a $20,000 surcharge to upgrade the grid. So that's a little bit of an issue. <laughs> now, obviously where those are not challenges, um, and I know there are a number of people in the audience here, especially folks who are accustomed to specifying European and international brands that have always been fans of, of induction. Um, and honestly, until rec recently, downdraft capability in this country hasn't been super solid. So it's interesting the, the, to the, hear the, you say it. There's two things there, though, that, you know, about the grid, because, you know, just by using gas and putting a saucepan on a gas hob, you're immediately wasting 60% of that energy. It's only using 40% of the gas when you when you when you're doing that. So you're throwing 60% of that away, just turning it on. Yeah. Induction, it's fully, 100%. You yeah. know, it's warming, yeah. warming thing, 100%. So, and, and then even on the downdrafts, you know, I can't understand why, you know, why it should be the end of the extractor, the traditional extractor. Agreed. Because why would you let anything get airborne if you don't need to? So even, you know, <laughs> even if you've got a great extractor, you're letting it, the air go up when right. you don't need to because it takes right. it straight from source. Right. So it, it, and it helps you design better because you can then put gas, um, you can put hobs on islands, which mean you, it's right. a better entertaining space, it's more social, yeah. better family. Your sink then can go against the walls, which yep. means you can hide stuff away right. if you're having parties and things. Right. So, like I say, uh, we were quite surprised that yeah. a lot of that, what we would be as basic design principles, are not even being shown there. I was actively looking for a downdraft and can't find one anyway. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but, but it, you know, I wasn't aware of the issues, so that yeah. it sort of explains. Well, um, it, it, it does, but it doesn't. I mean, it, you know, honestly, um, they are to be found, but it's, it's still a new technology in the minds of our customer. And so this is why it's important to be having these conversations and to share the insights that you guys are, are sharing. So thank, thank you for that, for sure. Um, Patty, clearly personalization is at the root of much of your philanthropic work. Yes. Uh, can you speak to how international consumers are looking for personalization through handmade artisan works? And, and how, do we, how do we think about balancing this desire for perfection in some things with kind of the personality that comes with one-offs in other things? How do you see that? It's really interesting. I think more and more people have become more comfortable with the idea of the imperfection. There's been the conversations of, you know, for years of wabi-sabi, that wabi-sabi idea from Japan, but also that idea that 
we seek now, especially more than ever, this connection that you have with something that's handmade. You can really connect to the person who made it. You have a story to tell often, which is the kind of thing that we love to share. It really connects with us on that emotional level. And in terms of how we see it coming through, even for the home for kitchen and bath, we're seeing much more wood and handmade wood. And if you think about it, almost every picture I was just noticing, and these pictures are gorgeous, you guys, my gosh. Yeah. I, I, like, I want to get some to put in, in some of our, our presentations. They're lovely. But you almost always see some sort of board or panel, paddle that's handmade, you know, often in reclaimed, recycled wood. You're seeing beautiful bowls as bowls become the new plates. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're eating many, many more meals out of bowls. So you're seeing these beautiful handmade bowls and all kinds of ceramics and porcelains. We're seeing a lot of, um, of uh, uh, fiber, basketry being used for organization. Um, so that again gives you that handmade thing. So people are finding ways to, to, to bring those in because they do add warmth to the home. They add a warmth to an otherwise very kind of clean and could be often sterile place. And then last but not least, we're seeing a lot of shelving, floating shelving, where instead of putting just kitchen things, and I think I talked about this in the other one as well, people have collections in their home and they're now starting to bring their collections, small parts of it into the kitchen and putting them on the shelves to display, again, that whole idea of bringing your, your, your living room and your kitchen together. And so it's all part of one sort of aesthetic, one decor aesthetic. Excellent point about integrating kind of the, the woven fiber basket tree into the more precise, you know, yeah, right, absolutely, um, the, ca the cabinetry and the kitchen furniture. Yeah. By the way, thank you for mentioning these images. I wasn't paying attention. This is the work of um, obviously Haley and Tony's firm, but also Kirk's members. And so these are all obviously reflective of the things that they are seeing in their markets. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, Kirk, you know, we've been using the term European kitchen furniture. Um, we talked a little bit about it here, but could you explain? how often, especially in Germany, when, when people buy a home, what the situation is around, especially the kitchen. It's completely different. And this is uh, what I realized here even more, because some things for us are very, very clear, mm -hmm. but we do not transfer it to, right. to the market here. So even when we look at the kind of production, the kind of manufacturing the kitchen is completely different. And this is a little bit because of our situation, our living situation. So even we were in, in the middle of this discussion discussing induction and gas. Mm -hmm. So it's completely different in, in Germany especially. I think uh, gas has a market share less than 4% in Germany. So it's uh, not existing, honestly. So we, are, uh, I, we just built in uh, um, induction and induction hubs and so on. Yeah. So it's completely different. And also the materials we are using, we don't use real wood, honestly. Uh, we use more melanin products, for example, and so on. But for us, these are the superior products in comparison to real wood. And this is one of the biggest difference of the impression the people have here. So for them, the real wood is the more superior product in the end. Uh, and this is a very, very big difference. And then in Germany, for example, more than 50% of the people are living in rented places. And in Germany, the tenants are responsible for the kitchen in their homes. So not the landlord is presenting this to the tenant. The tenant is doing this by himself. And so this is the reason why the production is much more automatic, even for higher quality kitchens. And so the prices are much cheaper than they are here. Yeah. So that they are able to build this in even when they are just renting a place. And when they are moving out, they are ordered to throw the kitchen away, which is not very sustainable, or they take this with them in the new flat. And sometimes you have the opportunity to talk to the people who is renting the place afterwards and can ask him whether he wants to keep the kitchen. But most of the time he says, no, I want to do my own. Sorry, take it with you. So it's a real big difference. And this leads then to a complete different kind of production, different kind of distribution. But nevertheless, I think if you're looking here at the German pavilion, you see that the products have perfect quality. And even carpenters in Germany, using this fully automated manufactured bodies, yeah. 
yeah. because the quality is even higher than if they do it by themselves. themselves yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for that clarity. I'm getting the high sign that we're getting up to the 10-minute Q&A, but I do want to throw out one last question, if I may, Nikki. Um, so, okay. If you were to select one major influence in residential kitchen and bath design in the coming year and a half, 24 months, what would it be? Haley. Um, I would say, when we were talking about trends, I think we like to say trendless, you know, so that things are more timeless. So you're buying better, you're buying quality, you're consciously spending and buying materials that you know where they come from, you know, because that's, that's our next generation of customer. They yeah. want to know where the wood comes from, what tree, what forest, you know. So it's really, really important that, you know, that we're conscious of where we're buying things and what we're buying and investing in quality and like craftsmanship, artisan, um, because all of those mixes of things make a kitchen or a bathroom more individual and therefore more timeless because it's a mix of things. So they're not, it's not really following the trends as it has been. Colors and things will always come and go, but the, the, you know, by mixing materials, inevitably, you're, you're, you're giving something that's much more timeless. Tony? Um, I'm more of a tech geek, so I'll go from a, I love cooking, so I'll go from a cooking um, cook. basis. Um, Haley could burn water. Um, but um, yeah, so I, so for me, it's it's using the technologies that are coming from commercial kitchens that are coming now into the domestic kitchen space. Things like steam cooking, um, vat packing. You know, the industry talks about vat packing in Europe about sous vide cooking, low temperature. But there's so many more benefits of vac vacuuming, um, storage, your long term storage, batch cooking for families, and then storing it in the vacuum keeps it healthy. You then put that in a steam oven to warm it up. It's a healthy meal as with all the nutrients as it was when you first did it. So for me, it will be more of trying to, I suppose, educate educate you know, um, our consumers about how they can live a healthier, uh, better life using the new technologies that are coming into the spaces. Excellent. Kirk? Yeah, I absolutely agree to, to the guys, but I want to um, implement one more uh, issue because, yes, the pandemic is over, but we are very much struggling with the Ukraine war at the moment in Europe. So even with the inflation and the much higher prices, we have to pay for nearly everything. So for the people, it's still a time of uncertainty. Yes. And if it's a time of uncertainty, I think it's very, very important that you have security at home. And when you want to feel secure at home, then you want to have a nice place there as well. But nevertheless, we now realizing, not in the absolute premium field, there is no problem, but uh, down there, the people are more hesitating in investing. And so I think that we will see some kind of slightly progress during a kind of uh, warmness and so on. But we will also will see that there will be much smarter kitchen planning needed than we needed before, because the ticket for each kitchen, the budget, I think will not increase as we are used to it in the last 15 years. So this will have a slightly impact. And as you mentioned before, I think everything will just evolve at the moment. Yeah, no, excellent point. Yeah. Patty, what about you? Yeah, the one that, yeah that, that's probably <laughs> sort of tying it all up in a bow. Everything they've said is, is really resonating. And that sensibility of just it's going to evolve. It's not the whole idea of, and to your point of trend as well, we, we, we think some people, some people think trend is a bad word, but it's the idea of the direction in which things will tend to move. That's really the, the definition of the word. And so we're not stagnant. We'll always be moving, but it's how fast, how slow, how much of an early adopter you are or not. So that sense of evolution within it. But, but, but I think we're going to stay very true to the human has been at the center during the pandemic much more than we were before. And I think the human at the center is going to stay. That will be something that remains out of this. And so how do we become more humanistic in everything that we do as a design? Yeah, I, th I think that's a very important point because we've all seen even this week <laughs> how much humans enjoy humans. So there you go. So with that, Nikki, or do we want to um, ask the audience if there are any questions for our panelists? Oh, there is one? Okay. Uh, 
Tony, you were talking about uh, the kitchens, buying kitchens uh, and rentals. Could you give us an idea of what the price points are? Yeah, no problem. It, it depends. So the average kitchen price in Germany is around $9,000. This is the average price so completely, yeah, yes. Yeah, and, and inclusive the installation and home appliances and so on. So, but even with the kitchens we are seeing here, the bigger ones, the nicer ones, you're there at approximately, I think, $20,000, we are around this. But in the rentals, we are talking about kitchens in the field of three to eight, 9,000 euro. It's a very different model. Now, part of that also is, in truth, some of the spaces are smaller. And so there are fewer components that are being acquired. But I, I think adding a little bit more on to Kirk's note, as the living spaces start to expand more into the living, dining, kitchen, one room environment, I, I think it will be harder to segregate um, necessarily those components that are being used, but it is a very different model than what we do here. And, and I can tell you, you would be very surprised how much hardware is used there, how much quality hardware is used there as well. And we are talking there, I think, between four and five home appliances installed there. So it's a good equipped kitchen and even the quality is nice. Yeah, it's, it's very nice. U.S. dollars? Yes. yes, it's U.S. dollars. Yeah. You get those at Ikea? I'm sorry? <laughs> you get them from Ikea? <laughs> no, 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 no. no. But, but sometimes, you're right, even in Germany, we have the discussion that even Ikea is more expensive than the high-quality kitchen wow. you can get by a retailer. Yeah, we, we buy a German kitchen, a furniture. I shouldn't say kitchen, it's German furniture. And if we want, if we need to be, we can be very, very competitive against IKEA yeah. and some of the bigger people, like the Brits would know, like Howden's and stuff. We can be, still be very, very competitive using German furniture. Wow. Absolutely, yes. The efficiency of the way they manufacture is amazing. Um, I think um, Marcus Sander from Hacker yesterday was speaking about the fact that he is able to manufacture 400, 500 kitchens a week for only th with only 300 people because the system is so automated. So they've taken a lot of cost out of the manufacturing without compromising the quality. It's really quite, you should go check out the German pavilion and check it out. All of these kitchens are close to completely fully automated produced. So you can see here, it's, uh, and even from the individualism point of view, you can nearly do every kitchen during this production site. So it's, each product is individual, but it's fully automated produced. With vast options as well, vast carcass options, vast door options. Yeah. Well, I'm getting the high sign saying it's time to wrap it up. Thank you all for being with us, especially on the third day of the show in the afternoon. We really appreciate it. And thank you guys so very, very much for coming from the UK and Germany and from Paris. Even though you're going back to New York, she just did just come in from Paris. So this is truly an international panel. Thanks again very much. Thank you. Thank you to thank be you. here. Thank you. Thank you. It's lovely to meet you guys.